Welcome to another episode of Fear the Old Lore, where we look at the English and Japanese versions of games for more insight into their lore. In this episode, we'll examine Life, Hollowing, The Undead Curse, and The Shackle of the Gods in the Dark Souls Trilogy. Let's begin. Warning. Spoilers for Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3 ahead. Despite being featured in all three games, there's a surprising lack of information when it comes to Hollowing and The Undead Curse. It may seem pretty straightforward at first, we're told multiple times that if a person dies, they'll lose their souls and part of their identity, and if it happens too often, they'll go hollow and begin attacking others. It's thought that souls can prevent hollowing, and perhaps even men one's ailing mind, but how true is this really? Virtually every enemy drops souls upon death, and in all three games there are corpses of hollows that have souls. Even if these are just meant to be gameplay mechanics and not relevant to the lore, the case of Maulin should be enough to call all this into question. For those who may be unaware, in Dark Souls 2, there's an item vendor named Mullen who tells the player he's from Volgan. As the player purchases more and more items from him with souls, he becomes less and less lucid, eventually forgetting his past and homeland entirely. His situation is troubling because he continues to lose his identity despite saying he's rich. If having souls doesn't prevent someone from losing their mind and going hollow, then there must be another reason for it. This has made me wonder exactly how much we know about hollowing is true, and how much is taken for granted. So before going too much further, I think it's best to ask, what exactly is a hollow? The term hollow comes from moja in Japanese, which when broken down literally can be understood as dead or deceased one. But it's also a Buddhist term that describes someone who's possessed with a single-minded desire like lust or greed. Though it can be used to describe those who are still alive, this kind of fixation on the material world can prevent someone from attaining nirvana and force them to wander the underworld. Localizing Moja's hollow does a great job capturing the general feel of the word, and while it's unfortunate it loses some of its religious connotations, it still conveys how hollows quintessentially lack something and mindlessly pursue what they desire. Since hollows are said to seek souls which are the source of all life, it's evident they desire life itself. It's a fairly common trope that the dead desire to live again, and Lucatil's dialogue may provide one of the most touching and humanizing insights in the entire series on what it's like going hollow. What is this curse? The question rings in my mind, but I haven't the focus to answer it. Loss frightens me no end. Loss of memory, loss of self. If I were told that by killing you I would be freed of this curse, then I would draw my sword without hesitation. I don't want to die. I want to exist. I would sacrifice anything, anything at all for this. It shames me, but it is the truth. Sometimes I feel obsessed with this insignificant thing called self. But even so, I am compelled to preserve it. Am I wrong to feel so? Surely you do the same in my shoes. Maybe we're all cursed, from the moment we're born. There's a slight difference in her dialogue that's hard to convey, but instead of saying she's obsessed with what's called the self in English, she says she feels imprisoned by it in Japanese. This will become more relevant later on, but for now, we can see just how terrifying going hollow is, and how strong the desire is to stay alive. Hollowing is often associated with the undead curse because the more one dies, the more hollow they become, but Dark Souls 3 shows they're actually separate from each other. Unlike the Chosen Undead of Dark Souls 1, or the Bear of the Curse in Dark Souls 2, the Unkindled Champion of Ash doesn't hollow upon death, and it's only after obtaining the Dark Sigils of Londor that hollowing can occur. There is some confusion about the differences between being alive, undead, and hollow, so to give a quick overview, undead comes from Fushi, which can be a little ambiguous. Its characters can be literally broken down to no die, but this can be surprisingly vague. For example, in English we have terms like immortal to describe beings that cannot die, undead to describe beings that are dead yet still alive, and amortal for things that cannot die because they were never alive to begin with. Japanese tends to not make these distinctions, so it's not uncommon for Fushi to be translated inconsistently. As for Dark Souls, Fushi is used to describe the undead, but more specifically those who will become resurrected by the undead curse should they die. This applies to both hollows and humans, even though humans are technically amongst the living according to the Japanese version of human effigies. 
It may be counterintuitive to think of the living as undead, though, so it might be easier to think of them all as just being undying instead. One of the challenges in talking about the differences between Hollows and the Undead is how vague the distinctions between them are. For example, when the protagonist dies and loses their humanity, they go hollow, but not necessarily to the point where they'll attack others. There's an obvious difference in hollows like Lucatil, Lenagrass, and Lap from the kinds of attack the player on sight, but there's no official terminology distinguishing the two. For the sake of simplicity moving forward, I'll refer to those who've lost their humanity and attack the player as Mad Hollows, and Hollow will refer to anyone with some level of hollowing. To briefly cover humanity, it comes from Ningense, which can be broken down as human nature or the human quality. It can be a little confusing in English since humanity can refer to the human race, but in Dark Souls it's meant to refer to the specific qualities that make people human. This is why the Red Eye Orb of One postulates the Dark Wraiths who steal the humanity of others may be more human than we. And while this is conjecture, it may also be why rats which tend to drop humanity gain sapience and can speak in Dark Souls too. It's not entirely clear, but it seems the biggest difference between being able to exist as a human and being a Mad Hollow comes from having will and rationality. If a hollow's willpower erodes past a certain point, they'll stop moving and appear indistinguishable from a corpse. In Dark Souls 2, some of these catatonic hollows even go invisible in the process of literally fading away. By the time of Dark Souls 3, some hollows begin regressing into trees, and hollows in places like the Undead Settlement and the Pilgrims of Londor have roots coming out of them. To be fair, Roots and tree branches might not be limited to hollows since herald knights, angel pilgrims, and the stray demon found on the high wall of Lothric have roots growing out of them, and even the bed of chaos was linked to the roots of a tree. If a hollow loses both their souls and humanity, perhaps they revert to something more primal. But this brings us back to the issue of Malin. Even though he has a surplus of souls which is thought to be enough to prevent one from going hollow, he still loses his identity. Now, I'm not sure if this is purely coincidental, but it's kind of funny that of the NPCs we meet, the ones who seem to be the most hollowed are those who deal with souls regularly, like undead merchants and blacksmiths. Putting that aside, we're told multiple times the curse and the soul are linked, and for what it's worth the sage's crystal staff in Dark Souls 3 says crystal spheres devour the will of the user, which is very interesting considering how crystals are created from souls. The soul and the curse are one and the same. Your soul has grown stronger still. I only hope it brings you what you wish. Do you know much about souls? Even I'm not certain, but... I'm told that the soul is the essence of life itself. Anything living, sentient or no, supposedly has one. What we call the curse is traceable to the soul. Do you see what that means? To be alive, to walk this earth, that's the real curse right there. We undead will never die. And that's quite a predicament, really. Generally, I try to remain skeptical of character dialogue since the information they provide may not be reliable, but there's a considerable overlap in what Shanelot, Solden, and Lucatil say with items like the Bow of Wint and the King's Ring that's worth exploring. If souls are the source of all life, and they're one and the same as the curse, it would follow that being alive can be considered a curse as well. For Solden and Lucatil, being forced to revive over and over until they lose their minds and go hollow, life is a curse. Even so, Life isn't easily forfeit. Throughout the series, we can see characters lamenting over the deaths of others, and as Lucadil highlights, they all want to survive, even if they're imprisoned by and must suffer immeasurable hardships due to the tiny thing called the self. Life is brilliant. Beautiful. It enchants us. To the point of obsession. Some are true to the purpose than they are of truth. Fresh in mind. What is it that drives you? Aldi and Vendrick's dialogue are meant to elucidate that life itself is a lie. It's so brilliant man is imprisoned by it. They come to believe in their false life so fully, they don't realize they're shackled by their obsession over it. All men trust fully the illusion of life. But is this so wrong? A construction of a facade, and yet... 
A world full of wounds and scandals. No, hello. Are you intent on shattering the oak? Spoiling this wonderful falsehood? And so, even if one were to realize that life itself is a lie, the question remains. Should we let it come to an end just so truth can prevail? One day, fire will fade, and dark will become a curse. Men will be free from death, left to wander eternally. Dark will again be ours, and in our true shape, we can bury the false legends of yore. Only... Is this our only choice? Seeker of fire, coveter of the throne. Seek strength. The rest will follow. Despite how beautiful life may seem, and how understandable the desire is to hold on to it, we're shown time and time again that attempting to hold on to life beyond its natural limits leads to suffering. Seath the Scaleless, with his fixation on attaining the scales of immortality from everlasting dragons, goes mad, and Logan and Osiris, who study the essence of life via crystal sorceries, follow suit. In prolonging the Age of Fire, Gwyn ensures life will continue, but by the same token, the world becomes more twisted and corrupted, and Gwyn himself ends up as a husk of what he used to be. The Undead themselves may be the prime example of what it means to be cursed with life beyond death, and virtually every character we see is met with a tragic end. Peace grants men the illusion of life. Shackled by fools who stay young for love, unaware of his grand illusion. Until the curse touches the flesh. We are bound by this yoke. As true as the dark that turns within men. The reason life can be considered the yoke or shackles of the gods to characters like Vendrick and Aldia is that life is destined to perpetuate itself in a never-ending cycle. It's why Lucatil would brandish this word against us if it meant she could continue living, and it's what's alluded to in descriptions like homing soul mass, deep soul, and the generic souls which can be found on corpses. Thus, in order to be freed from the shackles of the gods, one must die, which is why Yol begs for death to undo his shackles when we meet him for the first time on the high wall of Lothric. Please. Grant me death. Undo my shackle. It's a fairly consistent idea throughout the series and shows up in some surprising contexts. For example, in the description for Warmth in Dark Souls 3, rather than just saying the Mound Makers feared separation from the gods, the Japanese clarifies they fear the removal of the god shackles, meaning they fear dying and losing their sanity. This helps put into context Hodrick's warnings about the shackles of the gods being frail, and how the Pit of Hollows is used to pile up the sacrifices of Mad Hollows. The Mound Makers reaffirm their own lives by taking those of others, which is similar to the Brotherhood of Blood of Dark Souls 2, or even the Dark Wraiths of 1. Ah, if you wish, I shall grant the Art of Life Drain, the legendary power of the Dark Lord. It can preserve your humanity while undead, and cast off the shackles placed upon your brethren. Koth believes the Dark Hand can cast off the shackles of the gods, which implies to him the humanity stolen from men represents their true form. This falls in line with what Aldi and Vendrick say, though it may be a little unintuitive. Drang Lake will fall, the fire will fade, and the souls of old will re-emerge. With dark unshackled, a curse will be upon us. And men will take their true shape. There are a few semantic differences in Vendrick and Oldia's dialogue that can cast what they say in a different light. For example, when Vendrick says a curse will be upon us with dark unshackled, the Japanese is clear in that the dark isn't what's unshackled, but it's what undoes their shackles. The false legends of yore refers to life itself. And by burying it or being released from its shackles, men will gain eternity and death in their true forms. In darkness. One was a wayfaring knight on an endless, forbidden search. Only the abyss granted closure, if not reunion with his beloved. Fear not the dark, my friend, and let the feast begin. If this is true... It shows the dark is transcendental to man, and it would make sense why Koth believes sapping it from men would free them from the god shackles. 
And if Grandal and Agdane are correct in saying the Dark Cradles and is the mother of all, then the Locust Preacher's dialogue about the Abyss offering closure and reunion serves as a testament to its ability to embrace the collective unconsciousness of mankind. Thus, those who become engulfed by it run the risk of losing themselves entirely. And so, she lived in fear of the dark, of the things that gnawed at her flesh, and yet, the Abyss hath yet to produce any such creature. Fear not the dark, my friend, and let the feast begin. Those who fear and resist the embrace of the dark become consumed by it as exemplified by Irina and High Lord Wolnir. Resisting it is akin to trying to deny one's ultimate fate, which is why Wolnir gets forcibly dragged away by the darkness of his holy relics break. This fear of losing oneself is precisely why it's seen as a curse, but it's not necessarily the same as the undead curse which forces people to stay alive. So even though life can be seen as a curse to crestfallen characters like Saladin and Lucatil, to those who wish to hang on to it, death is seen as the curse. To make matters worse, aside from the undead curse, there are other kinds of curses making it more difficult to tell them apart. The Resist Curse of One states its sorcery of the red-robed Remedition Ingward, Guardian of the Seal in Nulando. Sacrifice humanity to undo curse. Abhorrent curses eat away at the core of one's very existence, and cleansing oneself of curses is no easy task indeed. Now, it'd be easy to assume these kind of curses would relate to the undead curse since it talks about sacrificing humanity, but there are a few discrepancies in its text and mechanics that need to be addressed. While it says humanity needs to be sacrificed, this isn't actually the case, and the Japanese description doesn't have any mention of it at all. Despite that, I don't think the spell was mistranslated. It's more likely it originally had a different function that got changed during development. It may have been meant to revert hollowing at one point, but we don't really know for sure. Aside from that, the terms used for curses in Japanese are a little inconsistent. While the title of the spell in the top paragraph used curse generically, the second paragraph specifies abhorrent curses, or curse death, is what eats away at the core of one's existence. It also uses specific terminology that's repeated in the way the dark eats through things, so even though curse death essentially means petrification, there is some internal consistency between the way curse death, the dark, and even crystals drain things of life. Since purging stones say they don't dispel curses, but only redirect and receive them, it would be a little weird to redirect what should be a gap in the core of one's being. This leads me to believe that being cursed is ironically being infused with excess life. This excess life doesn't belong to the host though, so part of their life is being continually eaten away by the curse, hence the reduction of max HP. Power Within states, excess power eats away the life force of its caster, so it stands to reason that curses are no different, and it even ties into the way the curse of the symbol of avarice drains its wearer, the way the chaos blade damages its wielder, and how chaos was spawned from a twisted bed of life. Life itself can still be seen as a curse this way, and it wouldn't necessarily be a contradiction for the curse to become cursed even further. Then again, it may not be that all life is cursed. It could be that it's a curse to be filled with life that's not your own. I am Agdane, guardian of the crypt. Countless dead rest here in peace, cradled by the comfort of dark. Light only agitates. We have no need for it here. Now, moving forward, I'd like to be clear the following is based more heavily on inference and speculation. While we know the undead curse is linked to hollowing, we're shown in 3 and arguably in 2 that they're separate things. Unlike the chosen undead of Dark Souls 1, or the bearer of the curse in 2, the champion of Ash doesn't hollow automatically upon death. Instead, they must first accept the dark sigils of Londor before they can hollow. Interpretations about the role of the dark sigil may differ, so let's start by examining its description and moving on from there. In English we have, A black gaping hole in the flesh that resembles the brand of an undead. The darkness of humanity seeps from this bottomless pitch black hole, the gap filled by the accumulation of the curse. This dark sigil will never heal, but there is a tale told of a firekeeper who returned from the abyss and brought great comfort to a bearer of the curse. There is a slight difference in the Japanese, in which instead of saying the gap is filled by the accumulation of the curse, it says the curse accumulates in exchange for darkness seeping out. This might seem overly pedantic at first, but it becomes relevant in trying to understand how the mechanics of the sigils work. Some believe, for example, darkness flows out from the sigil into the body, but that doesn't necessarily work if the curse fills in the gap left by darkness seeping out of it. The Japanese is vague enough to allow this interpretation, though, 
And considering how items like the King's Ring and Dark Souls 2 mention those with strong souls must bear even stronger curses, there is some merit to the idea that the sigils fill the player with darkness since they gain levels from Yol upon doing so. As I mentioned earlier, the Dark's affiliation with curses is well known, and we have multiple examples of exposure to the Dark leading to being cursed, like with Nashandra's painting and the other children of the Dark, or coming into contact with the Deep. If instead of filling a body with darkness, the Dark sigils allow darkness to seep out, then it could make sense why there would be a metaphorical gap for the curse to fill. But this brings us to a crossroad in trying to define what exactly a hollow is. If dark sigils fill the body with darkness, then it would mean hollowing is caused by exposure to the dark. However, if darkness seeping out causes the curse to accumulate, then it could mean either being drained of darkness or being possessed by the undead curse is what leads to hollowing. I tend to believe the latter for a few reasons. While it's possible the dark sigil description is a mistranslation, it's also possible the translators received additional insight from the developers about how it's supposed to function. Since I tend to focus on more literal interpretations of the text, I don't think this is a very compelling argument though. So ignoring that, we're also showing that the darkness of humanity in Dark Souls 1 is what's used to reverse hollowing. Of course, it should be taken into consideration that humanity must be offered to a bonfire to reverse hollowing, and just having a large quantity of it won't reverse it either. But by the same token, it's arguable whether human effigies allow the user to conjure darkness into them, so it's a bit of a wash. For what it's worth, enemies like Dark Race and Puss of Men aren't considered hollow in Dark Souls 3, so it seems a bit contradictory to me that darkness would cause hollowing if beings of darkness aren't hollowed themselves. Aside from that, I don't think it was a coincidence the translators chose to call them hollows. It was probably a deliberate choice to represent how they've lost something on the inside, and I think Gale turning hollow in his second phase after he bleeds out the blood of the Dark Soul is emblematic of that. Thus, when we reverse hollowing in 1 and 2, I think we're literally restoring our missing humanity rather than dispelling a curse. In the past, humans were one with the Dark. The former King of Light, he feared humans. Feared that they would usher in an age of Dark. How queer you humans. How you go on, never separating truth from fiction. It's possible the hollowing of the Champion of Ash differs from the previous protagonists, especially since it's gained through the Dark Sigils and can be removed via Purging Stones in 3, but not 1 or 2. Nevertheless, the Dark Sign signifies all three as accursed undead. The major difference between the Champion of Ash, the Chosen Undead, and the Bear of the Curse is that the Champion of Ash is unkindled. It's a little clear in Japanese, but to be unkindled is to be devoid of fire, which is why embers say no unkindled can ever truly claim the embers that burn within a champion's bosom. Some believe that since the unkindled were unable to become cinder and failed to link the flame, it's possible their dark signs cauterized, making it so that they don't hollow. If this is true, it could explain why the icon for the dark sign in 3 lacks the hole in the center of it, but it could just be a difference in how the artist handled between each game, and not meant to be significant. Others believe by the time of 3 that the strength of the first flame could have faded to the point true undead like the protagonists of 1 and 2 are no longer produced, but there's really nothing to confirm or deny it. Another idea is that since the unkindled Champion of Ash is a vessel for souls and can't retain heat on its own, the reason they don't hollow is because they're further removed from the power of the first flame. There's not much information about the Dark Sign, Dark Sigils, and Hollowing, but if Yol is telling the truth in that he teases out the Unkindled One's true strength because they're branded with the Dark Sign, then it would imply there's an implicit connection between them. One fascinating aspect of all of this is that in order to attain more Dark Sigils, the Champion of Ash needs to die multiple times to deepen their Hollowing. It's unclear why this is, and some believe it means the power of Hollowing ultimately comes from death. There's no definitive answer, and things are still open to interpretation. But one idea I've had is that since the Dark Sign drains its bear of their souls and humanity upon death, then perhaps Yol is able to reverse it somehow. So when we gain levels from maintaining Dark Sigils, we're regaining the power that would have been lost to the Dark Sign. Of course, the biggest issue with this is that the player can avoid gaining additional souls by simply jumping off a cliff, but this could be a case of game mechanics not meshing with lore very well. Nonetheless, it's only fair that these inconsistencies be pointed out, and it's possible the power of the Dark Sign comes from the first flame, and not the souls we bear. With that being said, one aspect of hollowing mechanics not aligning with lore very well is that in all three games, using the dark sign doesn't cause the protagonist to become hollow. 
This really fascinates me because if the dark sign induces death, but we don't go hollow, it would imply hollowing isn't strictly related to death either. While there isn't a proper answer as to why the dark sign doesn't cause hollowing, I think it could come down to how the dark sign is supposed to drain excess souls in humanity. When the dark sign is used directly, it drains one of their souls in humanity and sends them to a bonfire. However, it could be that if you die an untimely death, your souls in humanity get left behind in your bloodstain, so you have nothing to offer the dark sign when it resurrects you. As a result, it's forced to drain the protagonist directly, and it may be why we hollow when we die, but not when we use the dark sign. Obviously, this doesn't make as much sense if you have zero souls to begin with, but no matter how you view the dark sign, you're probably going to end up with some lore concessions to gameplay mechanics. Anyway, if Yol and the Pilgrims of Londo are able to reverse the flow of the dark sign so the unkindled can draw in more of its power, it could potentially tie into the usurpation of Fire Ending, where the Champion of Ash is able to absorb the first flame completely and draw upon its powers as its own. It's curious the previous two protagonists couldn't usurp the flame, but perhaps just like how the Ashen Estus class turns a bonfire's heat cold, perhaps an Ashen Champion can do the same to the first flame. Perhaps its heat turns cold, and the world becomes a dark and gentle place just like the one created by the Painter Girl of Ariandel. Or perhaps by usurping the flame, the world becomes one that's lifeless, free from the shackles of the gods. Without life, there could be no death, so maybe that's why we can see the formerly deceased Henri in the ending cutscene. Ultimately, I think hollowing and the undead curse comes from being forcibly revived by the power of the first flame. Just like with other curses, if there's an excess amount of life, it'll eat away at the core of one's being, but instead of being dark aligned, I'd argue it's probably a property intrinsic to souls, and thus closer to the way crystals can drain people's will. The darkness of humanity might be used to give people more substance, but I could also see it nibbling away at the excess life of the curse, just like it does with Firekeeper souls. But again, much of this is based on conjecture, so if you disagree or prefer another explanation, feel free to let me know in the comment section. To all my viewers, subscribers, patrons, channel members, and commenters, thanks for the continued support. Sorry for the delay, but I hope this makes up for it. If you enjoyed this video, please consider the usual nonsense to help support the channel with the algorithm. And for all of you who just can't get enough lore, feel free to join the Discord server linked in the channel description. There is no path. Beyond the sleep of life, beyond the reach of love. What could possibly await us? And yet we see it insatiably, such as our fate. Fear the old lore.